So I was talking to another film critic uh, <laughs> last night who said that he remembered you, that you used to work in Dallas and you used to review movies as well. Yeah, I had, I had a little, uh, my, my blog, which still exists and I still work right on, but I, I, uh, I love film criticism as, a, as an art form unto itself. And so I, I, for a brief period, was a member of the DFW Film Critics Association. Oh, I remember your name. I remember, maybe I've been doing it. I probably looked point. different than I had. I, I had long hair. And, it was all, yeah. yeah. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, I, 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 had, I kind of stopped doing that because at a certain point I was like, I'm, I was spending so much time writing reviews that I wasn't uh, working on movies. And, I don't know the Put the, yeah. put, put the car so. before the horse there, so I decided to get back to what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Well, you proven to all of us that that's what you should be doing. <laughs> this is Good. really a brilliant film. Um, it's funny, I went into it, because I talked to a buddy the night before, and he had said, oh, I was really looking forward to it, and I liked it, but I had a problem with the ending, and I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll watch it. Boy, I don't know what the heck he was talking about, because the way that this all builds to that ending, I don't know where it was going to go from there. That's exactly where it was all heading, and it's so heartbreaking. I remember, I, I really want to see it in the theater, but I had to watch it at home. Mm -hmm. um, and when it was done, I just kind of sat there like... Wow, I'm emotionally taxed, and I don't. I'm supposed to go somewhere right now. I'm just gonna sit here and take this in for a minute. And I was, you know, teared up. And it was. It's just a brilliant movie that flows really well. A lot like Malik, um, but a lot more dialogue. I keep saying kind of like like old Malik, like you know, Badlands yeah. or Days of Heaven. It's just wonderful. Um, is this is this even your script? I didn't even look. Is it you? Yeah. Did you write it? Yeah, it's this all fantastic movie. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad that the ending worked for you, even though it didn't for your friend. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, that's when you do these kind of movies. That's kind of inevitable. No, it's like it's like there's it's, you have to. If, if, there's going to be plenty of people who are on the right wavelength, and and there are, you know are things that aren't going to work for everybody, and that's fine. But you know, it's it's. I tried to make something that was distinct and that had its own personality, and and for the people that it works for, I'm I'm really glad that you know it operates on the wavelength that I intended. Well, it certainly does, and it flows like nobody's business. That's great. I mean, that's a word that I used on set. All I, I always am like, just like it's gotta feel like this, you know. Like I, yeah. I, I'm constantly just using my hands because I can't find the words to describe what it was trying right. to do. But, but yeah, the rhythm and the flow of it was something that was very important. And the the whole movie, you know, it's a very simple story. It's a very old fashioned story and a classic story. But it's something that I wanted to kind of approach in a new way and, and, and to, to let the tone take precedence over the plot and a big part of that is the way the scenes all kind of flow together and Absolutely. not you know I, I'm a big fan of movies where not much happens I like I like you know I like complicated movies too but when, when a movies can can completely capture you in like a very minimal amount of plot and just let things that you know little things feel significant uh, that, that's really important to me and I really love trying to just find ways to 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 Dwell on, uh, dwell on those things that I like and that I respond to without feeling like I'm spending too much time on it. Awesome. What was the process going from doing shorts to this? How much? I mean, obviously more writing, but I mean, you've also written some features and helped out with features like Pit Stop. Mm -hmm. What was it like writing your own feature though, compared to when you're writing Pioneer and Saint Nick? I mean, I had written a lot of scripts before this one, and none of I, they just you know. For whatever reason, I didn't make them, or they weren't very good, or you know, you 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 write a lot of bad things to get to the good ones, as they always say. Um, and then with Saint Nick, my first feature, I didn't write a script at all because I wanted to like find. I, I kind of wanted to get out of the mode of relying on scripts at all. So I, I made that film without one because it and and I I still claim to have written it because you know when you make a movie, you write it as they always say three times. You write it in paper, then you write it on set, and you write it again in the editing room. And if you remove the first version of that, you're sort of forced to figure out what it is you are trying to say in the moment on the set and to trust your instincts a lot more. And that was a really valuable um, learning process, both in short films and then in the feature in St. Nick, to do that. And then after I made St. Nick, I felt ready to go back to a script again. And, and so I wrote this one, but I still, you know... It, I love I love scripts as a literary form. I love writing things that um, you know. It's an interesting medium because it's something that no one will ever really read once the movie's made. It's going to just be it's a, it's a template. But for the for the brief time that it exists as something that people follow as a bible, you know, while you're shooting the movie and while you're leading up to making it, I I love writing things that that read well and it's a, it's a it's a fun process. But once we start shooting it, my my 
goal is always to throw it away and to not rely on it because you know you you write it and you internalize it and everybody gets you know the idea of what the movie is going to be and what it's going to be about and then you can kind of just like riff on it from there like you know you've got the platform you've got the con the the the, uh, the parameters in which you need to operate but beyond that you know there's so much that you can discover in the moment and that's like another reason why I wanted to tell a very simple story was because you can find these little things on the day that you wouldn't have necessarily expected or if you were trying to stick too closely to the script you wouldn't have had the time to discover and, and those are things that matter to me. So would you always do your own scripts? Would you think about you know, working with someone else's? Or? That's something that I'm dealing with a lot right now. They um, want you. They want you. <laughs> I'm, I'm writing, you know, I'm writing three scripts right now Jeez. for uh, <laughs> that are, you know, things I want to make. Um, but then, like, there's a couple things that have been sent, a, a lot of things have been sent to me, and I say no to most of them, but there's one that I liked, and I was like, well, if I rewrote it, I would do it. But I think to just, it's not so much a matter of, like, an ego thing. It's not that I want to control everything. It's just that I have, like, a distinct way of looking at things. And I can recognize that, like, I, you know, and, and another script might be great and it might be a perfect script, but it might be just to the left of my perspective. And so I'd have to get in there and just like yank it over here to where, mm -hmm. to where it makes sense to me. And, and that, that's something I'd be totally willing to do. Like I would, I would, if, if I found, uh, like the script I'm talking about, like if, if that one worked out, I would totally do that. And it would, it would ultimately, you know, feel very much like my movie because I would be able to just rein it over into the direction that I need it to be in. But I would love to also to find a script that's 100% my perspective without, that would just save me a lot of work, but I, I'd be able to do that. And I don't know if that will, I don't know if that's possible. I think, I think to get to know a piece of material, I would have to just dig into it that way. So, How did you, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> How did you get this cast together? Because you've got so many big names. And then you've got like smaller parts like Charles Baker, mm -hmm. who's in Breaking Bad. Yeah. I was like, hey, I think that's Skinny Pete, <laughs> but it was darkly lit enough that I wasn't quite sure. Um, then you've got Rami Malek, who's in it as well. So how did you put this whole cast together? Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the way I approached the movie was, you know, I was going to make it a very small, low budget movie. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't planning on on trying to get big actors attached to it because I felt that that was, I mean, that's, that's one way to get a movie financed, but I was, I was, I've always been of the opinion that I'd rather make movies for no money and get them made faster, um, and have more control over it than to make them for bigger budgets with actors who bring money and, and such. But at a certain point, you know, that's how I was planning on making this movie. And at a certain point, the script just sort of got some attention and it, was circulated amongst you know talent agencies and, and okay. people started to read it and wanted to meet and, and at a certain point I had an opportunity to say to, to, to you know I was asked who would you want to be in this movie you could cast anybody oh, wow. and Casey Affleck was right at the top of the list I mean he was the first person I thought of that would be uh -huh. um, good for Bob and then I, I was still convinced that I should cast someone who was unknown for Ruth because I, I didn't want anyone with baggage I didn't want anyone that had been um you know, too associated with another role. I was thinking of like Jennifer Lawrence when she did Winter's Bone, no one knew who she was. And that yeah. was a great place for that character to come from. Mm -hmm. And Rooney's agent wrote me and asked if if I wanted to send it to her. And, and my first thought was, well, Dragon Tattoo comes out next week. There's no way she's, ever gonna do this. she's never going to do this tiny little movie. And he said, no, she probably will really like this if you want to send it to her. We will. And I was thinking about it and realized that, you know, between Girls of Dragon Tattoo and Social Network, I had no idea what she actually looked like. And, <laughs> and, and I felt that probably no one had any idea what she actually looked like or what she was actually like. And also those two roles are so different mm -hmm. and that she was able to convincingly play someone from, from, you know, Sweden or Norway or wherever that movie takes place yeah. and, um, and have the accent and, and to transform herself so thoroughly. I, felt, yeah, she probably could play a girl from small town sex with Texas in the 70s and, and get away with it and no one would, would be the wiser. And uh, and so she read it and she watched my short film Pioneer and wanted to meet and and then said yes. And so she and I met Casey first and met her and then I met Ben um, and they all just agreed to do it. And it was a quick and, and painless process, to be honest. Yeah. And Charles Baker was someone I already knew from because okay. he, he used to live in Fort Worth up until recently. And, uh, and he 
just came out and read for a bunch of different parts. And I was like, I know you're going to be in this movie somewhere. We just try it. <laughs> we'll, we'll figure out which one. And, uh, and Rami Malek, like, I, I had not seen him in anything at that point. I'd never, The Master hadn't come out yet, obviously. And you didn't see Breaking Dawn. I like that. I did see it. I did see it. Um, I've seen every Twilight movie in the theaters. Um, uh, but uh, the uh, but he he submitted a tape for the part that Nate Parker plays, and we'd already cast Nate Parker, um, but his tape was so good, and I had no idea who this guy was. I was like, I was like, this guy is amazing, and so I wrote him. Was like, I was like, we already cast this part. Would you please play this other part at the end of the movie? And he. He thankfully said yes. And uh -huh. He's he's amazing. Yeah, well, Richard Jackson is a friend of mine. Oh really? Yeah. And unfortunately, we did not get the front of his face in the movie. But his you hear... voice, I just I... stopped everything. I went, oh my gosh, Richard didn't tell me. I just talked to him. And that's a uh, that's he his. Didn't tell me he's it. All that stuff he's doing it. That's he's telling a story, a true story. I, I I had a little bit of dialogue, but I was like, I was like. I was like, can you just talk about like home repair or something? <laughs> and he's like, he's like, well, this one thing happened once. So I'm like, that's perfect. Just do that. And we actually like, you know, the, we, we, that the dialogue that he has continues to that whole scene, like because it was just so good that I just when I was editing, I just like kept having him talk through, like, kept letting the dialogue it come was back. Right. I, I loved it. I, that, uh, you know. I felt bad that we didn't. We had this motif where like, we weren't showing the faces of anyone other than the main characters, so I felt bad for all the actors who came in. And <laughs> he was the chicken farmer in No Country for Old Men, and yeah. he was exactly like a chicken farmer. But actually, he's in real, before he became an actor, he was a nuclear scientist. Oh, that's so crazy. And he looks, the chicken farmer was perfect. And I think he was wearing the same, like, <laughs> unintentionally, the costume designer had, the wardrobe she had for him was exactly what he wore in No Country for Old Men. <laughs> How has your, your experience as a, a DP, as an editor, helped kind of shape your vision? Because compared to, like, especially Pioneer and St. Nick, you, you do seem to have, maybe it's the color, I don't know, that, that jumps from each film. Like, there, it's a signature that I can't put my eye on, and I don't know if it's because you have a background in cinematography and you get colors and you get, you know, look. Because, I mean, this seems timeless, even though it's set, obviously, in a specific time frame. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and the funny thing with St. Nick was, like, people never knew what time... Like, there were a couple I reviews... I can't tell. A couple reviews yeah. said it was post-apocalyptic, and I was like, it's, well, there's... You can see other cars. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh... The, uh... Um, but that's great. I mean, that, that's what we set out to do. I think, like, I was... I'm not a good cinematographer, but, you know, I, I, I feel that I do understand, to some extent, like, how light works and how to use it and... And then I just let other people who are better at it actually do the job um, at this point. Like, I will never DP another movie because it, it didn't work very well. Um, but, uh, but editing was something that definitely um, has affected how I direct. And I, I, I think anything that I do as a director is directly influenced by the way I think about movies as an editor. Because once you get engulfed in that process it's impossible to not think that way. And I think so much in terms of how movies are structured and how the rhythm plays out. And even when I'm writing a script, I'm thinking about how one scene is going to just play off another and how they're going to bounce together and how this scene might resonate with this other one further down the road. And, and that's something that, you know, definitely has come about because I'm an editor. And also just the pace and the, the rhythm and, and all of those things, um, you know, once you... Once you have cut a movie that way, like it's hard to to not think that way, and it's also hard not to edit the movies yourself, which is the first thing I did with working with other editors, and it was it was tricky because like it's like like what I was saying earlier with writing, you just need to get it in line with what you're doing. You need to grab it all yourself and just wrestle it into the position it needs to be for it to make sense to you, and and I wanted to have the experience of working with other editors, but um, what I realized was that knowing how to do it yourself. It's just so much faster to just grab it and do it yourself than it is to try to explain to somebody else. The benefit you do get from working with other editor, other editors is they bring ideas to the table that you wouldn't have considered, and uh, and as long as those ideas are coming, it's great. But when they stop, then it's like, okay, go away. I'm going to work by myself for a while. <laughs> it's going to be more efficient. Why about Keith Carradine? I mean, we didn't mention yeah. Keith is. Um, I mean, he was someone I wanted very early on for the part, and I, you know. Robert Altman is a huge influence on me, and so there's naturally, like, I naturally just kind of gravitated towards him for that reason. And, you know, 
he's in Nashville and McCabe is in Miller with these like this. He's this little kid basically. And, and then you see him in Deadwood and realize he's matured into this like character that has a tremendous deal of gravity. And not only is his, you know, physical stature and his voice, you know, full of, uh, you know, he carries his weight with him of, of, you know, authority, but he also has this entire history of, of amazing American movies to carry with him. And those, there's no denying that you can't watch him without thinking of all the movies that he's been in. And that's what's great about, I think, older actors. That they, is, if you cast them right, they're going to be bringing all that very positive baggage with them. So that was certainly exciting. Um, and he was someone who I wanted to go out to initially. And for a number of reasons, we weren't able to go out to him. And we were already shooting the movie and still hadn't cast that part. And I was like, I was like, we please go back to Keith Carradine. And they're like, okay, yeah, let's kick. And so we sent the script to him and he read it. And he was, I think he was camping with his, in his RV and he got in his RV and just drove to set. And, <laughs> and it was, wow, so and he was just the most amazing person to work with. Like such a gentleman, so much fun. And in spite of the fact that like in all these movies now, he's playing like a grizzled cowboy or, a, <laughs> or some figure of authority. He, he's just like he is in Nashville in real life. He's just like this easygoing, laid back dude. Um, and he, uh, and then he was generous enough to record the song for the closing credits also, which was a nice little coup de gras for the, for the final part of the movie. Oh, wow. I did and talk about the music. That is so mm. unusual. Yes, the music yeah. is fantastic. So, the the, music, and the way that it, you it use it to make everything flow, it's kind of yeah. like the, what you were talking about with the editing process. Yeah. Because like, this movie is, I mean, it's obviously, you know, a great story with great acting, but the thing that makes this movie is the way that it flows. And the big part of the way that it flows is the way that you use music. I, I remember when Ben Foster was sitting on the bed and he's about to play, you know, the little guitar. And I'm like, oh, if he does this right, this is going to be brilliant, <laughs> you know. And you did it. You did it just right. The way that it, you know, he starts to play it and then it flows to the next scene. And I'm like, oh, this guy's on the same wavelength <laughs> with me. Great. Right. So, yeah. The score was something... Daniel Hart uh, wrote the score, and he's from Dallas, and he uh, is a classically trained violin player who mostly has played with, like, rock and roll groups. He was uh, played with St. Vincent for a long time, Broken Social Scene, Other Lives, all these great bands. And he has his own band that's amazing as well. And he was introduced to me by Toby Halbrook, my producer and partner in crime, because they grew up together. And... He wrote the music for Pioneer, my short film, and he did one piece of music for Saint Nick, the feature that which that movie has almost zero music in it, but the piece that is he, in there, he wrote it. And he's someone who very quickly I realized got exactly what I wanted and what I needed without me ever having to talk to him. And that's like the ideal, like having that psychic connection with someone is like your it's the ideal point of collaboration because you know I can show him the movie or show him a script or show him a uh, some random piece of you know reference material and he'll go off and write a piece of music that turns out to be 100 percent perfect right. and not only perfect but something that i could i could never have said yes i want a piece of music that combines these instruments with hand claps you know that would yeah, never the hand clapping was yeah. a huge and it's in its continual motif throughout the whole film yeah and that never would have occurred to me and he's you know that's the kind of thing that he can bring to the table and I knew the music would be a big part of the movie, but not to the extent it, that it was. And what it eventually wound up being was sort of like the central nervous system of the entire yes. movie. And That's I'm, a great way to I'm always, it. Yeah. I'm always wary of like movies that have too much music or bad music. Or but this was one where I was like, I was like, you know what? Let's just go for it. Let's like, let's this music is good enough and strong enough. Like let's let this be the thing that binds everything together. And it really became sort of a character uh, in its own right in the film. Absolutely, the editing and the the music in this film is like it's just really really impressive um, awesome the, uh, and all the songs we in the movie are original too because we didn't want anyone to watch the movie and feel like just like we didn't want to say like Texas 1972 we didn't want, right. we didn't want anything that would specifically orient you to what time it took place in so I'm glad I got it right we were talking about that <laughs> in the, I was like yeah. it's either late 60s or early 70s someone wrote a review got. and said it's set in the 1930s I saw that yeah <laughs> was like, I, 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 that's, that's some watch the movie but I, that's, 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 that
but that's, that's great. That's you know, fine. Like that, you know. The, they notice the, the cars. There's right? the cars. Cars <laughs> are always what people don't notice. But, yeah. uh, or they just don't know what time frame certain cars are in. Exactly. I mean, the, the, the Bob's truck was from 1983. That was like our one. Like, it, it was like you're like, okay, it looks right though. It still looks right. But um, the uh, the all the yeah all the songs are were written to sound kind of like other music, but they're all original. So you wouldn't watch the movie and think. Oh, that's the song that I heard, you know, on the oldie station with my dad when we were driving to the mall one time. Or, right. you know, you don't want to have those those things that immediately draw you to some specific point of reference. And in so, your own life. Exactly. Yeah. Or or other movies that might have used them. Yeah. And so everything, for that reason, is completely original. How did the Sundance Labs help you kind of hone this film and, and figure out what you wanted to grasp with it? Or did they? I mean, they, the, 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 you know... I can't speak for Toby and James because they went to the producing labs and I was not part of that. But that was, you know, I was definitely on the periphery of that because I was hearing how it went. And that helped get the ball rolling as far as like getting the script out there. That's when people started paying attention to the script. And then when I went to the writing labs, you know, at that point, actors were already reading it. And so it, it was more about refining it. And there were a few things that needed to be fixed that I was kind of like pretending were not issues. And, you know, you sit down with, 10 people who all tell you, like, yeah, you do need to address that. And you're like, okay, I guess I'll, I'll take care of that. <laughs> um, and uh, and it, what, what it really did was give me confidence. Um, it was definitely a, like, going to those, those labs and, like, listening to people talk. And some people, you know, felt that it, it wasn't working. Like, they were like, the script's not working, here's why. And I'd be like, realize that yes, you are an award-winning screenwriter, but the reasons that you're saying this doesn't work, I disagree with. And being able to feel like, like realize that, realize that just because they're saying that they don't like how it works, that you don't have to listen to that was very helpful because it just like gave me confidence that I knew what I wanted. And there were lots of great notes, like really good notes, but some, you know, there were a few people, you know, it just wasn't their thing or they, they saw a different type of movie in it or they wanted it to be more of a thriller, or, you know, and they'll tell you like, well, you should do this and this and this to make it. And then it will work this way. And you're like, that's true. It will work that way if I do those things, but that's not the type of movie I want to make. And so that was really helpful. And then there's of course no denying that just like having Sundance approved, like have that stamp of validation, like saying like, this is something that Sundance supports uh, is it helps like there's there when it comes to independent film there's no bigger institution in, in the world and and that is valuable when you're trying to tell people to give you money <laughs> <laughs> can you explain the title yeah well, that's a great question because I told it to my kids and they were like ain't them body <laughs> saints what is that dad <laughs> it's uh it's there, there's a number of things that I could talk about with the title and and one of them is the, the origin of it, which is that it was kind of like misheard song lyrics. Casey was on the Jay Leno show the other night and told this whole story, so you can listen to his version of it. But, <laughs> but I, it, it was well before this movie was ever even something that was coming up. I just like came up with this title kind of based on the song lyrics that I'd misheard. And I, thought it was, <laughs> I just thought it was a nice phrase. And I really, um, it just like had a nice rhythm to it and mm -hmm. I liked it and and uh, when I started writing the script I wanted this movie to feel like an old folk song and I wanted it to have that sort of regional Americana quality to it and so using a title that not only had a musicality to it had a cadence to it and a rhyming scheme but also had a distinctly idiomatic untranslatable word like ain't right. and then a, a, a <laughs> grammatical uh, error in the first two words yeah. um, I felt that that was that you know, you'd get this title, and you would you would go into the movie, and and it's never mentioned in the movie, of course, and the title doesn't come up to the end, so you hopefully aren't thinking about it, right. but you just like know that this is what the movie's called, and you're going to carry that into the movie with you, and subconsciously, I think, kind of prepares you for the type of movie it is. It's also a title that you're not going to forget. That's there's yeah. no other movie, there's not going to be another movie called this. And and, and, uh, and then the other, I mean, thematically. <laughs> If you were to like think about this sentence or this phrase and like think about what it means, like every character in the movie is like trying to do the right thing and they're trying to do something good. And yes. Their own definition, their definitions of what the right thing are are different, but this title speaks to that and and it resonates with that theme and that is something that I felt validated it beyond that sort of you know textural quality that it had.
Right. And that's one of the things I like so much about this movie. I was just talking to somebody last night about, you know, everybody's talking so heavily about the new Woody Allen movie, Blue Jasmine, which is really well acted and really, really well written, but I really didn't like it because I hated everybody. In it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that seems to be a consistent thing is these movies that are maybe they're good, but I don't like anybody. And so I have a hard time sitting through it. And one of the things I love so much about this is there's certain characters that could have easily gone another way or you could have easily made Ben Foster a villain, mm -hmm. you know, and... Instead, you want great things for all of them. And that is why, when the movie ends the way it ends, it's so emotionally cathartic, I guess. It's just really, really wonderful, and I'm glad that you wrote it that way. That was, you know, one of those things that I kind of struggled with, because it, it definitely, like, you're like, okay, people will, you know, the, the vast majority of audiences will probably expect Keith Carradine to shoot <laughs> right, shoot uh, Casey at the end, or the right, or, he's or, a good guy. or for Ben yeah. Ben Foster want to get revenge on him, mm -hmm. and for it to be a misunderstanding that you know, you know. And I was like, no, let's not do that. Let's let's have everybody trying to do the right thing. Everyone, it's it's easy to write people um, into villainous roles mm -hmm. and for them to take those parts, um, but it's harder to like write people struggling to do the right thing. And, and that was something I always tried to. Whenever I was getting to a point in the script where it was easier to have like, someone turn into a bad guy. I was like, no, let's like keep them good. And like, you know, I don't want the mood to get boring. I don't want to be a bunch of nice people having tea all day long. <laughs> right. But, uh, but let's try to keep everybody, everybody, uh, trying to do, aspiring towards, towards righteousness, I suppose. Is right. And that's, that's literally like, I think that if you had gone in different directions, I don't know what these people in this lab told you to do, but <laughs> that would have been one of them. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> but if you had gone in that direction, this movie wouldn't have been as good. I mean, this, there's all kinds We've of different that. ways. We've seen yeah. it. Exactly. Yeah. You've seen it before. Yeah. Exactly. There's all kinds of different ways this movie could have gone and it could have been an interesting thriller. It could have been a good action movie, all this other things. But the thing that makes this movie so good and the reason it's like, you know, I, I put it number three yesterday on like the hundred some odd movies I've seen this year. Like it's really high up there for me. And the reason for that is literally because of that quality of that, you know, these are characters who are inherently good. And then on top of that, like, like we said before, the music and the way that the movie flows, it's like d d you care about everything that's going on. And I also like that you, like in the beginning, you chose not to show like the robbery and all that other kind of stuff. So you're just kind of... Again, we've seen it all. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you're getting, you're getting the human part of it. And then you come back in the end to, the, to where it begins when he's in her lap. And so it's... It's largely poetic in the way that it's put together, and I don't, you, I don't know if that's the way that it was in the screenplay, but like you said, the editing process, you edited it into like this visual poem. And it's, yeah, it's pretty much the way it was written. We went when we were editing, we went all the way around to like a massively different version, all the way back to exactly where we started. So. <laughs> awesome. Well, we gotta wrap great. it up, guys. I love oh, okay, that's okay. <laughs> well, what do you have going forward? I've got. Oddly enough, this Free Disney movie that I'm got hired to write. Really? Um, Can you say the name? Like, yeah, it's a it's a, a, a remake of Pete's Dragon. Oh, oh red! Sweet. That <laughs> is super red. It's not, I mean, I have an Elliot. My mom made me an Elliot doll before I was born. I still have it. I just gave it to my son. That's, that's awesome. So we, cool. We sort of like are looking as like you know. It's a little boy named Pete, but other than that, it's completely. It's like the, if the dragon flew away at the end and found some other. It's like a different story, but right. it's, it's going to be. Um, it's it, it's oddly enough, like Disney went for like they. We heard they wanted to remake it. We were like, oh, that'd be kind of cool. We went and, and 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 pitched an idea that is very much you know in keeping with Saint Nick and Pioneer and, and this movie too in a weird way. So like, <laughs> if they, if they make, I mean, it's going to be we're it's writing be a musical. Yeah, they don't want they don't want oh, a musical. Okay. Okay. They don't want a musical. So. I mean, I'm really excited with the script right now. It's going to be a really awesome children's or family film. Like, we want to make a movie like, you know, you think about Black Beauty. That's a movie you love as a kid. Oh, yeah. And then it just gets better the older you get. And yeah. E.T. is the same way. And, and we want to do something like that. So hopefully that happens. And oh, that's Are you going to so keep the cool. animation aspect of it? or? Um, no, it'll be it'll be live action. Oh, okay. Like all like with I'm just, I, if, if, I'm not directing it, so yeah. If I were, I'd be like, oh, we gotta do it like with practical like where the wild things are. Like, yeah, like those, that would be cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. He needs to look the dragon. needs to look the same. Elliot can't. Just, but, yeah, <laughs> he's gotta be the same. <laughs> that's like the one thing. Yeah. Um, and then I'm writing this movie that's an adaptation of a New York article that. Um, it's for Robert Redford to star in and mm -hmm. produce, and then the idea is that I'll direct that also. 
Oh. Um, but you know, I'm still writing that, so we'll wait. And we'll see what they say when they read the first draft. <laughs> and then, uh, um, but that's that was really exciting. Just to, like actually like have Robert Redford hire you to do something. So oh yeah. Yeah, oh, that's um, really in the Sundance. Okay. And, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. And then I'm writing something else uh, that Casey and I are developing together. So who knows what will happen first? First. But, yeah. <laughs> You're still in Dallas. Yeah. Like, <laughs> You're not leaving any minute now, are you? I'm <laughs> leaving tomorrow morning for New York, but I'll be back in a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, I, I've got... And then when he wins his Oscar, he's like, sorry, guys. <laughs> I, I live, the only reason I would ever move is because my wife can't take the summer. <laughs> yeah. That's how my wife is. <laughs> Everything yeah. from Germany. Every summer, like, she's like, this is the last summer here. <laughs> <laughs> That's been happening for a number of years now. Well, too. But, uh, so we'll see. But no, I... I Really like it here, so awesome. thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.